Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, so as as it says, I'm the uh, I'm a senior FAE or FAE in most books, but I like to put CE on there. I got there eventually. Um, for last seven minutes, as you may or may not have heard of us, we're like the distant third place in the FPGA world behind the Zarks and Altera. Um, we probably, if you have heard of us, if you've been around long enough, the 90s or so, we're a CPLD company like all the others. Um, we were pretty late to the game before my time in the CEO at the time, didn't really see the FPGA map come in, which was a bit of a blunder, because that's kind of where everything is now, because of CPLDs. But, um, the last few years we've really started to differentiate ourselves from Zarks and Altera in that we're focusing very much on the very small FPGAs, by that I mean maybe a few hundred lookup tables or up to several tens of thousands of lookup tables. So whereas you would probably get things like hundreds of thousands of lookup tables and 200, 300 meg from uh, Zarks and Altera or even the Cornix if you start to look at them, that's pretty high end stuff, um, we're right down at the other end of the, of the, um, the market space. So, I'm going to talk about um, open source processors, microcontrollers, so definitely the MOR, uh, the more one KX, and also we have our own, which you can have across as a Miko or Miko 8 or Miko 32. So um, I'm going to go through those. I haven't been here before to this, this uh, conference, so I wasn't sure where to pitch it in terms of technical or not technical. So I try to keep it as techy as possible, and I've tried to remove as many of the marketing slides. I don't think there are any in there, but I pulled this stuff straight from our you know, internal repository, so that the marketing guys are all over the slides. Hence <laughs> why you get nice graphics and stuff. You know, that you so, um, we have two internally developed open source um, microcontroller microprocessors. So, they're both called Miko. The Miko 8 is, as the name suggests, the 8 bit processor one, there's a, and then there's a 32 bit processor called the Miko 32. Um, the Miko 8, I'll go through first. Um, the, so the, the average, it's a pretty simple, I mean the, the press itself is tiny, it's like 250 some bucks. Um, we use it in a lot of places actually, as a general purpose control plane processor. It's, it was largely developed actually as a bit of an internal demonstration utilization thing, so we, when we put together a demo we could hang a bunch of control plane stuff of it and actually it looks, uh, yeah, something, so something like this. So, it's all based so it's all based on open source server, so it's all wishbone protocol. Um, all, we provide the very log of HDL for you know, so it's all true open source stuff. Comes with the, the same LGPL license as the as the, as the not all open stuff. So um, we generally want to develop something that was really compact that we could fit into some of the small FPGAs that would allow you to do um, just basic hooking together of control plane stuff. For a long time it was assembler only, so it was a real geeks kind of thing, and then um, we've added onto it a C wrapper, but we've got a lot of effort into the C compiler so it doesn't bloat the, the assembler code. That's one thing we always are struggling for on our small FPGAs is block handling. So, um, it's a different sort of challenge you used to with FPGAs over the recent years. You kind of just you know, throw any code in and it'll probably fit because you've got loads of specs. But when you're looking at a really small end FPGA, um, one of the targets is to try and keep things as small as possible. So, um, so this whole this whole implementation, I think you see on the right, you can expand it by adding some external memory or adding it to the block RAM, but if you want to, I think it fits in two block RAMs, um, let's say a few hundred LUTs. The code is all there if you want to have a look at it. But most of it is actually just the, 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 sort of the decode the instructions and so on, so you can add remove instructions and shrink it and so on. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty neat processor. It's probably, I would say, but well, to, to me, until I started looking at some of the repositories for the open source stuff, I, I thought it was way more widely used than the Mika 32, but it seems there's quite a lot of use of the Mika 32 that we don't get to see in terms of that. So maybe the balance is, is a bit more equal than I thought, but I certainly see a lot more people using the Mika, Mika 8 than the Mika 32 for whatever reason. Um, it's got a pretty nice graphical uh, configuration wizard, which is um, Actually, it was a bit of a, when I came around to start using the the the, the, uh, the Opsox solution, I was I, I got got my I got used to falling back into sort of nice non-engineered ways of using a graphical computer to, to, to put everything together. So when I came around to manually hooking things together again, I had to kind of go back to my engineer days of how it all works. But the GUI is kind of nice, you know, it's, it it all works. It's robust and tested. You you drag a processor, you drag some peripherals, click it up, and it gives you all the RTL for it. It's kind of a nice system. Um, it's for the Miko 8 system, it, it's it's sort of twofold. You can develop the hardware this way, 
it's directly equivalent to just having, um, I've used the FUSOC now, so the FUSOC has the sort of top level and a, and a, and a, and a nice arbiter development tool, a generation tool. So it, it, it's essentially replicating that process but inside a, a GUI wrapper. And I see just some nice things in terms of validating revisions of uh, peripherals and so on. It's, it's kind of nice, and, you know, in case certain peripherals become out sync with each other, it'll give you a, a flag to say that this is, this is a kind of valid combination and so on. It's also got a development environment, again, graphical if you want, but you can use it's all based on GCC, so you could just do it there. You can do the software development on the command line just as easily. It all wraps up into a make managed project uh, project project. So nothing particularly alien there. Um, depends on what your background is. It does offer a really nice low barrier of entry though. If you just want to pick it up, the tutorials make it you know really straightforward to just generate something on one of the evaluation boards and so on. Um, so I've shown you this. This was just to give you an example of how a typical system might work. Um, I'm going, so the flow of the present of my talk is going to be that I'm going to go through the, the devices if I've got time last. So if you've got any, you know, I, this one talks about the Mavic so 2. Uh, the main aim was to get across the process of stuff, so but if, you, you know, if you've got any interest in the devices themselves, I'll go through those. Um, so we've got, actually you can put this on pretty much any device, any platform, but the one of the nicest ones is the little Pico development kit. So, if I suggest, it's really low cost. We, um, depending on where you catch us at the, the engineering shows and so on, we have to give these away because they weren't designed to give away. But as we found in the past, if you attach a zero dollar value to something, people think it's kind of worthless, and so they don't find an interest in it. It's a bit weird, really. And obviously, from an open source point of view, it's kind of a non concept. But for us, as a, we've had lots of things where we've given away for free, and people go, ah, it's obviously. You know, does it work or something? So, so we, we attach a nominal value to it and then give it away for free and people say, yeah, you're getting $49 for the kit. Right. Um, but the, so the, the Pico board is quite nice. I've got, um, I didn't bring any of those with me, but I've got a couple of the other boards with me in case anyone's interested in seeing them. Um, the, as I say, the Amico 8 board can be developed and put onto any platform. It's so small. Um, the new family that we've just acquired a couple of years ago, the Silicon Blue was a company that we acquired a couple of years ago. The technology, the ICE family technology, is the most awkward technology to put this onto, mainly because the processor uses makes use of distributed memory, and the ICE architecture, the way it's done, can't really implement that distributed memory too well. So it tends to bloat quite a lot when put onto the ICE architecture. It's not to say it doesn't work; it's just it's bigger and not quite as compact. Uh, um, but nevertheless. If you wanted to, you could um, oh, Marketing available now. There we go. <laughs> for five years now. Um, so that was the Miko 8. Um, it's really basic. Um, but the, the nice thing about it from a, um, sort of implementation point of view is it's so small, you can parallelize it, quite a few of them. But it's mostly used as a control plane processor when you just want to hook together a bunch of low end peripherals, spy, I squared C, you uh, um, small block memory or something like that. So for pushing control plane bits of data around it's really quite nice. But again everything is open source really. So the Miko 32 was so the Miko 8 has been around forever. Um, way predates me, I think it's 10, 12 years old or so. Um, so the Miko 32 came around around 2006, I think 2005, 2006. Um, and it was certainly an attempt to offer an equivalent level of capability to the uh, NIOS that you get from Altera. Um, there's also an Alex equipment. Yeah, there you go. So um, the nice thing about coming to the market for everyone else is you can see how they've done it and say, oh, that's quite nice, we'll do that and we'll improve that. So the feedback we get, or I get, is that it's pretty good compared to the NIOS. So and NIOS is like the golden standard. You know, it's, it does things really nicely. So if you can get pretty close to that, I think that, that was um, that was our aim. Um, so initially there was a lot of development work on this, so probably for the first two or three, maybe four years, through to about 2010, there was a lot of development work internally on this. The last two or three years, I would say that, well, definitely internally, the development team has been reduced down to a couple of guys now. So it's, it's mostly keeping things up to date rather than actual development, which is a little bit of a shame, but um, it's still very current, you know, it's still supporting all our latest software. So if you download our latest software from the web, which is free of charge, you can, you can get hold of this in there. So. It's still very current. So it's a processor, I, I, I included a slide, 
please don't ask me about this, process architectures are not my strong point at all. So, um, if you know a bit about process architectures, um, I'm sure it will mean something to you. From looking at the diagrams, I think it's pretty similar to the, the way that the, uh, the MR1KX is implemented, but don't hold me to that. Um, but it's, it's certainly um, pretty familiar to me from the little bit that I knew about the architecture of the MIGA 32 when I came across it, didn't, it didn't feel too early. Um, okay, it's generally designed as a control plane processor. It'll run at about 100 megs, so it runs a little bit quicker um, on our FPGAs than, um, than the, the, the Oxford processor would do. Um, but it, again, it's you know, at that sort of speed, it's still a control plane processor. But nevertheless, it's got a nice bit of peripheral set built into it, and it's still wishbone based, so anything that you can break down that's wishbone compliant from open, open cores will do your work on there, depending on how certified <coughs> and how tested it is, and so on. Um, I included this slide, it's really marketing but the idea is to show the sort of development flow. It's got, a, it's got a quite a neat, quite a tight development loop. So, um, again, we've got the graphical. Uh, entry tool for the developing the hardware. So this becomes a little bit nicer now in terms of the 32 because there's more configuration of the processor itself. You can choose the data, the cache, caching sizes. You can choose if my memory or not for, um, for whether you want to have an external memory block or internal memory on the chip. So there's quite a lot of configuration you can do with the hardware, and it starts to become a lot more user friendly, if you like, for me. In some, it's I suppose it's directly equivalent to the. Um, use the latest version of the MLR1KX, the um, top level parameters for configuring the, the hardware, the processor. So a lot of that's brought up into a GUI wrapper essentially. Um, and then you can add in extra peripherals. The nice thing about this is we allow you to add custom peripherals. So we've got um, companies that have developed solutions, partner company. I mean, there are probably third party companies out there that have nothing to do with those, but we've got partners that have developed uh, one quite nice one is a video uh, image signal pipeline. So they've put together a whole bunch of peripherals that end up living in here that you can just drag and drop those into the processor, things like uh, so if it fits to a sensor you can do linear delinearization or effective pixel correction and so on, you just drag and drop them in and configure them. It's quite nice, you know, nice little solution. <coughs> um, then we've got the C environment, so again this is directly back to where we were with Amico 8. Um, but Quite, the, the thing I like about this probably most is the, the, de, the, the way the debug flow works. It's a pretty tight flow through the debug flow. So, in, all within the same environment, you can, you, know, you can set break points or off points. You can click a button to, to go in, invoke what is essentially GDB, but with a graphical wrapper around it. And then um, you can see the code, you can debug the stack trace and so on. Modify the code, recompile it, and download it in, all in one tight loop. I'm guessing it's pretty much the same as running on command line. But Software is never really my thing, so um, I don't really know how to do it so well on the sort of command line environment for the software. But from a, a hardware guy's point of view, this is quite a nice tight flow to be able to go through the, the, the software the software debug um, without having to. Um, I quite like it. Yeah. It, worked, it works nicely from a simplistic point. So I've included this slide because this is probably the one dedicated Mika32 development kit we've done. So if you go looking for Mika32 development kits, this is what you'd find. Um, it's quite old now, it's based on ECB2 technology. So ECB2 is probably 2007, 2008, which kind of dates back from the initial days of the release. The reason we didn't really do any more dedicated hardware platforms because it's essentially it would work with any of our evaluation platforms. And many of the later ones included memory blocks on there and and flash memory and so on, stuff you need for processors. So uh, I think we didn't really see the need to do any dedicated platform, a uh, dedicated power platform. Nevertheless, this is quite nice. It's got a lot of peripherals, although the, you know, it's really quite dated now, but it's got quite a nice lot of peripherals for control plane uh, applications on there. The DDR memory in particular is looking a bit dated now. But, um. So those are the two natively developed um, processors open source processes that we have. So they're both fully uh, LGPL uh, licensed, they're both fully open source. I should say the GUI environment is Eclipse, if you've used Eclipse, so it's, it's pretty industry standard. I know TI make heavy use of it on theirs. It's not perfect, it's certainly got you know, quite a lot of foibles and bugs and so on. Um, that's, I think that's just comes part and parcel of the way the Eclipse platform works. But it's pretty neat, you know, I showed this to customers who've never used the Vita32 before but they're familiar with Eclipse and they're familiar enough to get it with it. So 
I'm guessing if you, if you come across it in a different guise, it would make sense to you. Um, so I was going to move on to, so for the last 12 months or so, I've been working on a project for a specific customer, making use of the, um, well, start out with Opsoft V2, so the OR 1200 processor, and then probably around the beginning of this year, I switched over to the, the latest implementation processor. I think my timing kind of sucked, because I came on, I started, I downloaded the first version last August, and just before the latest version was implemented, so, you know, I spent the first sort of three or four months just learning my way around it. Um, but as a result, I've, I've done a lot of the, I suppose the development work for the processor end of it for my customers, quite unusual scenario, normally the customer do a way more work, they must have negotiated a good, a good deal with my boss, I guess. But, um, I ended up doing a lot of the development work for the processor side, and um, the, as a result, I know my, you know, I've got to learn the processor side quite well, I think, now. so I've got um, a quite an interesting level of, of knowledge of, you know, the, of, the, of the implementation itself. So. I thought I'd share a bit of that here. So, well, I mentioned it started, so it started a year ago. Um, so, I, my development hasn't really been for fun. It's well done. It has been fun, but it was it was a specific application that's driven my my development of this. So, I, to, before I came along, as far as I'm aware, no one had ported any of it to the uh, any of the old sock stuff, to the lattice processor, or at least the uh, lattice VGA, or at least no one had published such. So, I started largely from scratch, which it wasn't that big a deal, it's pretty generic RTL, but certainly in the porting of it into our tool flow there were quite a lot of challenges to overcome in terms of getting everything to map, uh, synthesized correctly and so on. Um, but nevertheless I'm expecting, so the, the work I've done so far is based on customer hardware, obviously that won't be published unless they want to publish it, they may do, I don't know. Um, but the work that I've done will uh, will be published under, with our own evaluation platforms. Um, I'm hoping to have that by the end of the year. That seems, uh, seems like a doable time frame at this stage, but you never know what's going to come Can you comment on why they wanted to use the ML1KX over the LM32? Specifically, they wanted to run a Linux kernel inside. So our own implementation of it um, doesn't have some of the necessary components, specifically in LMU, but some other books as well to run a Linux core inside. So, um, actually, they, they specifically wanted to run Linux. They didn't really care whether it was an embedded processor or not. But they have a very small it's like the size, it's about double the size of a credit card, that's their PGA size. So that's their PCB size. So um, they were also really short on, um, well, they had a whole bunch of specs. So they didn't have much power budget, they didn't have much heat budget. Um, adding an external processor on there, while it's doable, was probably difficult for them. So they wanted to have the same, and we came out with a new family of FPGAs. Around the start of the year, which happened to give a large footprint of, of logic for a very small area, which is one thing to be focused on. So the whole thing kind of fit together quite well. Plus, they're a customer we know pretty well, so you know, relationship helps in that scenario. So that, that, that was there was no one reason, but then the driving reason was the need to put the Linux kernel inside there. So. And that was where a lot of the focus for me has been, which is definitely it's a non-Linux. I've not done any sort of Linux development in my life, so. That was a steep learning curve for me, but, you know, and a lot of help from these guys and getting working, so it's good. Um, so, yeah, so uh, as I say, at, at this stage, their hardware, the customer's hardware is, is running. It's, to give you a bit of uh, idea of the application, it's, um, it's a new standard for satellite TV. So at the moment, in the UK at least, if you want to watch satellite TV on your iPad or your phone, you can do that. But the, the video data is sent over the internet the whole way to your uh, to your iPad. So the satellite providers obviously have an interest in they broadcast to your house anyway to the satellite dish. So they want to take it from the satellite dish and put it straight onto your iPad. And so it's so quite a neat little spec that will basically put it straight onto your home network from the satellite dish. But it requires quite a lot of intelligence in the little block that sits on the end of the satellite dish. So um, the UK-based satellite TV provider, Sky, they're one of the sort of major leading guys for this, so they they want to get it running as quickly as possible, but no one's really got the hardware to do this, so when a customer I've been working with has developed a thing, and that's what this is going to do, so it will take the satellite data, and the, the Linux is running a software layer on top of that, and, and it'll basically push it straight onto your, your own Wi-Fi network, so you can watch all the channels from your satellite provider on your iPad, so it's pretty neat, I think. Um, it's running now, so at least 
the Linux side of it is running, the, the actual customer application requires you know, more work from their side, but as far as I'm concerned, the bit that I, the, the, the processor side is pretty fully functioning. So I'm, running, I'm sure there's bugs to debug and so on, but uh, it's working pretty well. So, so from my side, I, I, that, that's the basic implementation. Um, I haven't really started anything that I would consider lattice specific, so um, I just started to look at, and I was mentioning before, just about um, things that I've noticed that aren't particularly efficiently implemented for us. So things like we our LUTs can be configured as distributed memory, something that we share with Dynamics, but Altera FPGAs can't do that. So some of the memories that get inferred are pretty small, so they can be very efficiently done in logic. Um, as opposed to, because a memory block is 18,000 bits, that's in our FPGAs, I think the same is true of Sinex and I think the same is true of Sinex and but, but some of the memories just end up being a, a few hundred LUTs, you know, they're like a, a, a thousand bits or so. So it's a pretty fit, inefficient to fit it into a, a block run. So some things like that where you can shrink, you can slightly increase the footprint in terms of LUTs, but you can reduce the EBR count, and overall I'm expecting to see a bit of an increase in, in, in frequency as a result of that. So those are some of the things I'm going to work on. But it's currently running at 75 meg to give you a benchmark, um, which I think is pretty typical um, of what you might expect to receive from, say, a, Sp uh, a Spartan or a Cyclone. What synthesis tool are you using? Do you have your own? We have our own. I haven't used that yet. This is based on Simplify. Yeah. So um, we've always used Simplify, and then actually a long time ago, about five years ago, we started developing our own. Um, about a year and a half ago, we released the beta of it, for the small devices, and we've just released it in beta for the full family of devices now. So the results that we're getting at the moment are that it's quicker to run, which is a little bit of a bonus, but probably more importantly, it's a slightly smaller footprint and a slightly higher max. So it, I mean, it should be because it knows about our architecture. You know, Simplify has one model, and that model is pretty heavily tuned for the Xilinx and Altair FPGAs. I think personally, I think for the Xilinx FPGAs. Um, and our FPJ doesn't look that much like a Xanax FPJ anymore. They have got six architecture, they have a lot of routing, they have a lot of clock grenades and so on. So the when you take that model and apply it to our FPGAs, that, to me it, it produces a pretty bulky implementation. So I'm expecting our own synthesis tool to do a much better job. Um, the results are pretty good so far. But it, the families that we've initially tested on are a lot smaller, so the amount of logic in there is, is a lot smaller. So it's, an e it's a much easier job. So. Um, as we take it to some of the larger families, the ones with, say, 10, 50, 150,000 number tables, that's, a, that's obviously a much more difficult job. So. But, yeah, that's, that's where we got to at the moment. Um, well, that was, well, I've kind of detailed myself here. So, the, the application, I've kind of described the application itself. There's nothing particularly special about the peripheral set on there. Um, probably the nicest bit about it is the memory controller, so it implements a, a DDR3 memory, so the customer has some pretty high bandwidth uh, requirements on the memory, so they want to, um, if they took the processor away, they would still need to have some, some large data throughput to the DDR3 memory, uh, taking video data essentially off of the satellite, taking it, convert it, it storing the memory, convert it to Ethernet data and pushing it out again, and the processor wants to be able to access that in a sort of the, the, the code takes put into memory, tells the processor, the processor breaks it back out, that's a little bit of it, it back in, and so on. So, um, the, the, there isn't really a, a, a scope to put two DDR3 memory blocks on board, um, at least not in the one that will be up on the head. It take too much power, you know, it, it's just a lot of space, that sort of thing. So, the idea was to have the DDR3 controller allow pseudo simultaneous access to, between the processor and the, and the um, the rest of their code. So uh, it, it's working pretty well that code now. So the, the controller that I've developed allows proper DMA access into the memory. It's really high bandwidth DMA access. The processor gets second priority, but because the processor is only periodically accessing the, the memory to you know, grab bursts of instructions, it, it works pretty well. There's, there's a it's a pretty minimal impact on the processor performance once you get the DDR3 when you buy the DMA going. So yeah, I think it's, it's working pretty well so far. So this part I'm, um, will be part of the published work. The, uh, what, actually, one thing I haven't really come across yet, or I haven't really discussed, and I don't know if you guys know the answer either, but the DDR3, something discussed offline for certain, the DDR3 IP is our own IP, which I certainly can't provide open source. And, you know, so it comes as a compiled block. So I don't really know how that works with the licensing. Because you're making comms. 
Well, so it's our own IP, so this, I don't need access to these. Oh, it's, it's, it's like a netlist or something. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, can we provide it as a netlist? I would like to do that. Uh, but it's the same thing, I guess, as the Xilinx tools, where you have yeah, like and MGD or yeah. or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Your, I mean, your MOVAR one KX has got quite a permissive license. I yes, the it's license is very permissive. So you, mm. you couldn't, you couldn't do it under GPL. Right. Be screwed. But I, but well, the, we could probably talk about this later. But the the mm. spirit of the LGPL is you can. Oh, oh yeah, the LGP. Yeah, the LGPL. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, technically, I think it would add uh, support for two sub for generating it on the fly. Ah, uh, okay. Ah, oh, yeah, that would that would work. Yeah. That's that's what I have uh, figured out. I should do for like core gen and mega wizard. Yeah, because we have the same thing. IP Express is our core gen yeah. equivalent. So. Okay. Okay. So that that would probably work. Okay. That was a slight side. Um. So that's that's kind of where I've got to with the the implementation of it now. So, um. I was interested in your figures of two point two k for the smallest implementation because I've been asked what the smallest implementation would be. Um. I didn't really put too much effort into it, but I didn't manage to get past small. So I'm yeah, but that's without then the new. Uh, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. but you know that was. Yeah. I still be yeah. I'll, I'll have to go back and look at how I did that again. Maybe ask you again then. options for that. So um, how are we doing for time? Uh, a few more minutes. A few more minutes. Okay. So the last few slides I have are talking about some of the devices and hardware platforms and so on. So. The first platform I worked on uh, to put together a hardware system is uh, for our ECP3 family. Um, and we have a development kit called the Versa Kit. So this is a pretty low cost kit. It says $99 there. I don't think it might have gone up a little bit since then. I don't know. But um, this was, it's a pretty neat platform. Yeah. So it's, it's quite a nice platform from this point of view. It's got DDR3 memory on there. It's got um, RJ45, so you can do, um, you can do Ethernet on there. You've got a bunch of other pretty low end peripherals. There's PCI Express on there, but I haven't done anything with PCI Express on there at the moment. But, um, this was the original platform that I started to develop this for because we didn't have anything on the target, so it can easily be fine. But I'll certainly be going back and putting together the implementation for this because it's pretty much done. I just need to rework the, the latest stuff that I've done back into that. Um, so the ECB3 family, in case you're interested, is very similar to the Cyclone and Spartan family. At the stage when we released this, we hadn't really started to go down the path of differentiating ourselves on size and so on. So it still covers up to 150,000 lookup tables, which at the time was pretty comparable in size. Um, it's a 65 nanometer process if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, has service channels on there, so you can do PCI Express or I see a whole bunch of different protocols. It's really quite nice quality service on there. Um, and TSP, ISP IO, and ADC and that. So it's a pretty neat family. Um, so I, I, I include this sort of stuff so that when you get the slides afterwards you can reference it all. It gives you an idea of the family. Um, the ECB5 family is the, type, is the sort of next generation. So this is the one that I'll be, I'll be working on at the moment. So this is largely an iteration of the ECB3 family. So um, at this stage we're still looking and feeling quite similar to what you'd expect from a, uh, from a slide, from cycling family, but sort of more compact, lower power, and Care about that sort of thing, lower prices. Um, the, you, you, the real, real reason for the ECB5 uh, ECB being of interest is that generally it fits in a sort of more compact footprint. So if your space is constrained, that's probably the most interesting element about the ECB5. There are a bunch of other slightly more detailed elements. I don't really want to start a sales pitch here. I don't like the best of times that I've learned at tech meetings. And again, another uh, uh, slide giving you the, the, the family members if you want to look at them offline. So there's an evaluation platform for this. So um, this this one, I only have a quite uh, sort of non-transparent <laughs> version on my desk at home. That's the first version with the alpha silicon on it. So the main release of this will will come along, I think, pretty soon. We've got engineering silicon now, which uh, the first device. I think we've got production by the end of the year. Once they're production silicon, we'll have loads of these boards be shipped out. So this again is aimed at the same sort of cost point as the Versa board, so this would be $150, $200 I guess, I don't know the target price, but something like that. Um, and again, as a similar level of capability, so actually there's a slide here giving you a breakdown of um, the different bits you would expect to get on there. Um, it's quite a nice platform I think for this sort of thing, it's got, it's a 
Um, and then this, now, there was a while, a while ago, there was a, a bit of interest. When I first came on board, the first project that I got, I don't remember who I got it off now, someone else, but someone sent me a project that someone had started to port the uh, Opsop V2 to the Mac XO2 family, because there was some interest in having a really low, um, like a low density, a really low density version of a device that fits in maybe three or four square nodes. Um, so I thought I'd include some slides on here. This is not something I've started to look at yet because all of the work I've done so far has been based on the slightly larger family, the ECD5 family. But the Mac XO2 is a, uh, one of our marketing call it ultra low density, but it's essentially right now from a few hundred LUTs up to a few thousand of the tables. Um, so the idea is you have a single chip, so it's got onboard flash, it's got an onboard I squared C and spy hard coded block on there. Um, it's got some pretty fast I.O. on there, but it's also got an onboard regulator if you want to provide a single 2.3 volts of supply and so on. So it's included on this slide with the, with the ICE family, which was mentioned before. So this is the um, technology we acquired when we acquired Silicon Blue with E4 of the FPG and U. So this is a, a similar, I don't think any one company would develop both families because they overlap quite a lot, but um, generally speaking, it's, it's smaller, the Silicon. So it, it's, the die size is smaller, so it'll fit into a small footprint. But otherwise, they look pretty similar. And um, we're limited in terms of logic size. It only goes over to 8,000 lookup tables, any of these families. So I'm, in, I'm, gonna, I'm looking to see what sort of start about the capability I can put into an evaluation platform for these. But certainly we've had a few customers that are asking about implementations based on the low, uh, low footprint devices. So. And there's a bunch, of, bunch more slides in here, but I think so these slides you can have a look at after doing, they give a, a bit of a description about it, but I thought I'd just mention uh, that slide again. Um, $49 e-sale from so you can see it. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. Thank you.